Hello, everyone, and welcome to the VMC Animal Health Education Series. My name is Scott Horsfall, and I'll be your host this evening as we hear from leaders in veterinary medicine as they share their expertise in areas ranging from relevant health information for your beloved pets to ways of advancing clinical research that will serve dogs, cats, and people for generations to come. During the presentation, you can use the Q&A function in Zoom to ask questions. We also ask for pre-submitted questions, and we'll do our best to cover the themes that came up most frequently during the final portion of the program. Please note that if your question for tonight's presentation relates to your pet's specific medical care, it is best to call the VMC directly or have your primary care veterinarian contact our team for a consultation so we can best serve you and your family. With that, I'd like to introduce our speaker tonight, Dr. Stephanie Goldschmidt. Dr. Goldschmidt is an assistant professor in the College of Veterinary Medicine at the University of Minnesota and leads the Lewis Small Animal Hospital's Dentistry and Oral Surgery Service. Dr. Goldschmidt's primary goal is to educate veterinary students so they are prepared to practice general dentistry after graduation. Her subspecialty clinical and research interests include oral oncologic surgery and advanced, advanced treatment of dental trauma with root canal therapy or crown placement. We are grateful to have Dr. Goldschmidt with us tonight to discuss dental health for your pet and what you should know. With that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Goldschmidt. Thanks, Scott. Um, so I'm going to start sharing my screen. Um, I will apologize. Just I am at home today, and I do have a, a pretty young child, so hopefully she participates throughout the uh, throughout the presentation. So what I'm going to be talking to you about is kind of dental health for your pet and what you should know and what kind of things you should think about from an at home standpoint. So the things that we're going to chat about um, today, the common oral abnormalities that we're going to cover are periodontal disease and fractured teeth. So periodontal disease is probably the most common thing that we are going to see in dogs and cats. And we know that over 80% of dogs by two years of age and over 70% of cats by three years of age have some evidence of periodontal disease. So by far, this is the most common problem that we're combating. The other thing that we can see is fractured teeth. So we know about one in every four dogs will have some type of dental alveolar trauma. And when we use that term, we're talking about any type of trauma to the teeth, but the most common being fractures. So periodontal disease is inflammation of the periodontium, and that inflammation of those supporting structures leads to progressive attachment loss. So when we're talking about the periodontium, we're talking about the structures that keep the tooth in the jawbone. So the supporting structures of the tooth. So those include the gingiva or the gum tissue. Those include the periodontal ligament or the ligament that holds the tooth into the surrounding bone, the cementum or the kind of tooth that's under the gum line and then the alveolar bone itself. So it's kind of the glue or the supporting structures that keep the teeth in the oral cavity. So what kind of sets off periodontal disease is the presence of plaque bacteria. And this is the primary reason that we get this inflammation of the periodontium. But the really important thing to keep in mind is this level of inflammation is host dependent, meaning that, you know, not every dog or cat is going to respond to the presence of plaque in the same way. So Plaque is a bacterial biofilm. So you know when you wake up in the morning and you kind of feel that um, kind of like sweater-like material on your teeth, that's plaque. And what it's made up of is bacteria, but also polysaccharides, proteins. It naturally will accumulate on the teeth. And then as plaque mineralizes, it becomes calculus. So that's when we see this kind of brown material on the teeth themselves. And the purpose of calculus, this mineralized plaque, is to protect the plaque. So it starts to mineralize within 48 to 72 hours. Um, and what it does is it protects the plaque biofilm. So it protects it from being disrupted by things like antibiotics, but also from mechanical disruption as well. Um, and the longer we have plaque on the teeth, and the more mineralization that's able to occur, the more we'll see this kind of brown discoloration on the teeth themselves. So the primary mediator of periodontal disease is even though the plaque sets it off, it's actually the host. So what happens is the host tries to fight off this plaque bacteria and it's trying and trying to fight off the plaque bacteria and it almost works too well. So it actually starts to get a little bit of loss 
of that supporting structures itself. So we start to have that periodontitis or inflammation of the supporting structures and then eventual loss of the supporting structures. So when we think about how severe the periodontal disease is, it actually has kind of two facets that we need to think about. One is how much plaque is there, right? That's what sets it off. And that is really dependent on lifestyle and home care. So are we doing anything to disrupt that plaque? And then also, you know, natural things that might increase plaque accumulation, like having that calculus there, having a malocclusion or kind of gingival enlargements, things that are going to keep that plaque or that bacteria on the teeth. And then the other really big one is genetics. So you know how you can eat a whole bag of candy and get no cavities and your friend might get cavities even though they're really healthy. Just like in humans, dogs do have propensity for having more severe inflammation or a more severe response to that plaque than others may. And then the other big piece of it is systemic health. So anything that might immunosuppress the patient is gonna make that periodontal inflammation worse. So when we think about periodontal disease, we think about it as having two facets. So the first being the plaque. So we know that that's what sets everything off. But then the other is actually how the host responds to that plaque and how aggressively the host responds. And that's a really big thing that a lot of people forget about is that not every dog and cat is going to have the same periodontal prevention plan because it really is going to depend on those two factors. So how likely are they to accumulate plaque and how is their body responding to that plaque? So when we see clinical signs of periodontal disease, how does that kind of show up? Initially, the things we're going to see are gingivitis, right? So that's why everyone calls this gum disease, because we can see inflammation of that gingiva. That's one of the really first signs that the host is responding too aggressively to that plaque that's there. Another really early sign is bad breath right? So halitosis or bad breath is because there's too much bacterial accumulation within the mouth and that's causing this kind of smell. But with time, what this can progress to is more and more attachment loss. So more loss of the kind of supporting structures between the tooth and the jaw. So we'll start to get pockets forming, right? So we'll lose kind of that bone and periodontal ligament that attaches the tooth to the jaw. The gum might recede away, the tooth eventually can become mobile because it loses all of its attachment. And then we can get into more serious complications like tooth loss or oral nasal fistulas and jaw fractures, right? As we're losing more and more of that bone and that periodontal ligament and the gum that are holding the tooth into the um, surrounding jaw bone. So when we talk about periodontal disease, we put it into stages. Um, so these stages are used for both treatment and prognosis. So you might hear your veterinarian talk about, you know, this stage of periodontal disease. Um, and those stages rely on two things. So one is the intraoral examination, and then the other is intraoral radiographs. So you cannot actively or appropriately treat periodontal disease if there aren't x-rays being taken. So just like when we go to the dentist and we need to get those x-rays, the same for our dogs and cats. So when you're thinking about, you know, where you're going to have these procedures done, it's a really important question of, you know, are you taking radiographs and is that part of our treatment plan that's going on? So when we talk about periodontal disease stages, they can go anywhere from zero, which is normal, and then one to four. So periodontal disease stage one is really where we want to keep our pets, okay? So this is gingivitis only. So we can see, you know, in this dog and cat, this redness of the gum, that's gingivitis. Um, but this means that there's been no attachment loss. So no attachment loss or loss of those supporting structures are noticed on, on probing or um, radiographs. So really when we talk about periodontal disease, this is where we want it to stay. We wanna keep our dogs and cats in stage one periodontal disease. So when we talk about stage one periodontal disease, the prognosis in these cases is excellent. OK, 
Okay. So the reason we say it's excellent is this is the only reversible stage. This is the only time that we can take that gum disease and actually revert it back to normal. So this is really where we would like all our pets to stay. Okay. We want them to stay in this stage one periodontal disease. Um, Scott, sorry, this is my first um, VMC series. A number of people are raising their hands. Am I supposed to respond to that now? Nope, you don't got to worry about it. Lauren okay. is taking care of all the questions and compiling them for the, for the end. So you're okay. good. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, so when we talk about how do we treat periodontal disease stage one, the initial thing that we're going to do is we're going to remove that plaque and calculus, right? We're going to remove that inciting cause. Um, but that plaque, this is kind of gross to think about, but that plaque actually starts to accumulate on the tooth immediately. So essentially seconds after you have a professional cleaning, it starts to reaccumulate. So not only do you need to professionally remove the plaque and calculus, we need continued home care. And a big question that I um, will get a lot of the time is, you know, why do we need to do anything professionally? Why can we not just do home care? And the reason is there's just always going to be plaque, especially plaque under the gum line that is not going to be removed um, with just brushing. And especially once it's mineralized. So once that plaque becomes calculus, we can no longer manually remove that with brushing. We really need to rely on an ultrasonic cleaning to get rid of that plaque and calculus. So when we talk about home care, um, you know, what are we doing after that professional cleaning to make sure that the plaque is kind of kept at bay? I usually talk about the pyramid of home care excellence, okay? So when we're thinking about how can we prevent plaque accumulation, we have the best stuff up at the top and the worst stuff down at the bottom. So brushing is always going to be gold standard, okay? So brushing is the best thing that we could ever do to help prevent plaque and calculus accumulation. And um, really when we talk about brushing, we're talking about once a day brushing. So um, I know a lot of people are wondering, well, how do we do this in our pets? So this is my husband, as I said, it's kind of COVID times I'm working at home. Um, so when we talk about brushing, I'm going to show you guys just a little video on, you know, what that looks like and using kind of my dog as a model. All right, so we're going to talk about how to properly do brushing in a dog. My dog, Duke, he's going to be here as a model. So the biggest thing is you first want to get them really used to being near their mouth. So I would just touch the tooth and, oh, you're so brave. You're so good. And give him a little treat so he knows he's doing a really good job. Duke's a little scared. Just want to take this treat right now. That's okay. Um, next, you're going to kind of work up to after doing that for a week, touching the tooth with a toothbrush. Kind of coming in, oh, good dog, and getting them used to it. Then when they're fully ready, then you can kind of graduate to brushing a full quadrant. So when brushing the quadrant, you want to be the 45 degree angle to the teeth. You're coming like that. And then working on that outside, oh, good boy. He will kind of periodically stop throughout and give them a treat. Because they don't get cavities like we do, it's less important to worry about time of day or not eating while you're doing it. It's really mechanically disrupting the plaque. That's once you've done the top, then I'll usually come in and do the bottom and get the front teeth. Oh, brave boy. And just try to make it a really positive experience for them. So I'm just gonna show you again on a model. So again, looking at that 45 degrees. So the bristles are coming right underneath the gum line and then letting them open their mouth a little so you can get the bottom at that same angle. We don't worry about the occlusal surfaces of the teeth as much and we don't worry about the inside as much. So you guys can see that, right. oops, here we go. So that would be kind of how we do that brushing. And the biggest thing is trying to make it as positive as possible. So um, getting them really used to going towards their mouth. So, you know, 
starting that kind of just touching the tooth for about a week, getting just touching with the toothbrush, you know, for about a week and then kind of graduating up to that fully brushing. And, you know, as you can see, even in my dog who's really good at me being near his mouth, you're never going to be able to get all the plaque. And that's why brushing is the best at kind of decreasing plaque and acute pack and calculus accumulation, but it's never going to get us to zero, which is why we still need those professional cleanings to kind of pick up the slack, right? Just like in us, we brush twice a day and we do a much better job than we're probably doing in our dogs and cats, but we still need those professional scalings um, to make sure that we're getting the rest of the plaque, especially the plaque that's under the gum line. The reality is it can be very difficult to brush in dogs and cats. And we realize that. So kind of other options that we could do are kind of here on this home care pyramid. So the next one that I would recommend would be a dental diet. So I think dental diets have pretty good evidence that they can decrease plaque and calculus. Um, dental diets that I particularly like would be Hills TD. I really like that diet. Um, I do think though, you need to keep in mind that sometimes nutritionally, it's not the best option for your pet to replace their main diet. You can give, you know, like a piece of TD as a treat. We just don't know if it's going to work as well as it being the primary diet, right? It just hasn't gone through the same studies. If dental diets are not an option, um, nutritionally, then I also really like dental treats. Um, ones that I particularly like are Tartar Shield. I really think they're a really good option. I do like Greenies quite a bit. Uh, Greenies are the only nutritionally balanced dental treat on the market. So that's a really good option. Um, and those are usually the two that I use the most. Oravet treats are also quite nice. Um, but essentially when choosing any dental treat or diet, you want to make sure it has this veterinary oral health council seal of approval. And what that means is it means it's gone through a clinical trial. Um, so it had, you know, a group of dogs that just got regular kibble and a group of dogs that got kibble and a product. And it was shown to significantly decrease plaque and calculus by at least 20%. Um, so we know that it, you know, is going to help at least 20%. Um, but you can see these things that are up here on the top of the pyramid are things that are going to mechanically disrupt the plaque. The plaque is kind of created to protect itself and not be as good at being disrupted by things that aren't mechanically getting it off the tooth itself. Other options that I think are, are good, but not as good would be dental sealants. These are essentially barriers that got placed on the teeth after a professional cleaning, and they help to prevent plaque and calculus reaccumulating on the tooth. So they essentially change um, kind of the surface of the tooth so that plaque and calculus can't accumulate as well. Other things that you could potentially do include rinses or toothpaste. Um, again, because those aren't mechanically disrupting the plaque itself, they're not gonna be as good of an option, but a lot of them can help, especially if you can't get in the mouth to do some of these other um, options or nutritionally, they're not a good option. And then the last thing, the thing that like is better than nothing, but would not be what I recommend are water additives. So adding something to the water is just never going to be that good because it's never going to mechanically disrupt that plaque biofilm. Um, and just most of the studies on water additives don't have as good a science behind them, in my opinion, as some of the other products. So when I think about what I'm going to do and what products I'm going to choose, this would kind of be how I make my determination from best to worst. Um, and they're still always better than doing nothing, but I'd always rather something mechanical than, than a water additive or kind of a rinse or toothpaste alone. Um, the other thing I do want to mention is you can brush with anything. You don't have to use a toothpaste while you're brushing. It's really rare for dogs to get cavities. So really what we care about is mechanically disrupting that plaque. So you can brush with water or chicken stock. Um, there's no study that shows that brushing with a toothpaste is any better than brushing alone. So try to make it something that's really yummy, something that tastes good. Um, that would be kind of a better option than a toothpaste that they don't like. Um, and if ever you're using a toothpaste, it needs to be a doggy toothpaste. So fluoride is toxic if swallowed. So you need to make sure that it's a, a dog specific toothpaste. And when you go on the kind of veterinary oral health council website, this is what it's gonna look like. So it's vohc.org 
And then you'll get to these accepted products and you can see the whole list of accepted products for dogs and accepted products for cats. And this is where I would recommend going to choose a treat for a diet um, for your kind of treatment regime. So a big thing, I know we spent, you know, a good amount of time talking about home care is I want you all to realize and remember that advanced periodontal disease can be prevented. So the biggest thing is proper plaque control, right? So that is what sets off periodontal inflammation. So regardless of breed and having that host um, kind of predisposition to periodontal disease, if you're really good about keeping the plaque at bay, we can prevent periodontal disease. So when we think about, so when are we going to start with this prevention? We actually recommend starting very young. And this is based off the AHA or the American Association. I actually am not sure what um, it completely stands for, but it's kind of the overall um, veterinary kind of overseeing body that looks at, you know, when we should be starting these cleanings. And what they recommend is starting by one year of age for cats and small dogs and two years of age for large breed dogs. And the reason we recommend starting so young and getting full mouth x-rays so young is it allows us to kind of make a treatment plan for that patient, right? Like how likely is that patient to have concerns? Um, and it allows us to identify incidental findings, right? So things that might be a problem that we might not see on our awake oral exam. After this first evaluation, we normally recommend the next evaluation 12 months later. Okay. So we'll go and we'll say, Hey, we'll see you again in a year. And then when we see you again in a year, we can see what's really needed for your patient or your pet. So some dogs, you know, based on home care and their genetics might look great at a year. And we'll say, all right, let's do the next cleaning in two years. Some patients, unfortunately, you know, by a year might've had progressive disease. And we might say, Hey, for your patient, unfortunately, you know, we're going to need to do cleanings every nine months. Um, or we're going to recommend cleanings every six months. And so it's really about tailoring the periodontal prevention plan based on how good you are at home, right? At preventing plaque accumulation and just the genetics of how likely they are to accumulate plaque and how they respond to that plaque, how aggressively they respond. Our goal is prevention. We want to keep our pets in PD-1 where we can always revert them back to normal, where all our changes are reversible. As we get to those more advanced stages, especially stage three or four, that's when we're actually having to do surgery because we're having so much attachment loss. So that stage two, we can often still kind of be okay if we have a little bit of attachment loss, the prognosis is still good. But again, once they start to get more advanced attachment loss, this is when it really starts to be a problem. Um, we really don't want this to get to stage three or four, where to be honest, surgery is our only option. So when we get to periodontal disease stage three, this is when we have about 20 to 50% attachment loss. So here's an x-ray of a canine tooth or a big fang tooth. And the bone is supposed to be here. And you can see that actually that the tip of the bone is all the way here. So we've lost all this bone that's holding the tooth in the oral cavity. So now our prognosis, unfortunately, at saving this tooth becomes fair. And this is what happens when, you know, we have continued plaque that's there and the body just keeps trying to move away and away and away from that bacteria. We're going to get more and more and more bone loss. So when we get to this PD3, we really only have two options. The first would be to extract the tooth um, and you know pull that tooth or an advanced periodontal therapy. And advanced periodontal therapy includes either local placement of antibiotics or sometimes we'll even consider local placement of bone. So replace that bone that's been lost. Um, but what's really important to keep in mind is for any of these advanced therapies, we have to recheck them and make sure they worked, right? So often we're needing to recheck them six months after they've been performed. And that recheck is under anesthesia again. Um, so, you know, a lot of people will choose to actually extract the tooth because they don't want to go forward with that follow-up. The last stage of periodontal disease is stage four, when we've had greater than 50% attachment loss between the tooth and the surrounding jawbone. And in these cases, the only option we have is to pull the tooth. Um, and so unfortunately, we are, you know, pushed into a point that we have to do surgery. And 
a lot of people will also ask me, well, why do we have to do surgery, right? Why can't we just, you know, leave it alone and allow it to continue to progress? And the problem is when we have advancing periodontal disease, we can have some fairly serious complications. Um, so the first is tooth loss. So we can lose so much attachment that the tooth falls out, um, which can definitely be uncomfortable. More serious complications we can see would include jaw fracture. So you can see here, this is that lower molar tooth. And the bone is supposed to be up here where my mouse is. But you can see actually the bottom of the bone is all the way here. So we only have this teeny little bit of bone that's left on the jaw. So this is commonly we have this little bone. The dog will, you know, jump off the couch or, or knock his face while playing and this jaw will break because it's so weak. Other things that we can see are we lose so much bone on the top by the fang tooth that we actually lose the bone that connects between the teeth and the nasal cavity. And we have a hole then between the mouth and the nose. So now every time this dog eats, food is going up there. The dog can actually aspirate through this hole as well and get aspiration pneumonia. Other side effects we can see are infection of that bone or osteomyelitis. And also uh, it's more common in humans than dogs, but it's also possible to get distant infection. So when we have so much infection sitting in the mouth, it can enter into the bloodstream and then seed in distant areas as, such as the kidney or the heart. Um, it kind of puts the whole body into a pro-inflammatory state. So it can be very serious to have advanced untreated periodontal disease. So um, really what we want to do is prevent it, but if it does become more advanced, we want to make sure we're treating it as well. So that's kind of what we're, you know, the big important things to talk about for periodontal disease and now we're going to talk a little bit about those other common things we can see, which are tooth fractures. And then um, we can spend some time answering questions because I, I know there are a lot of questions about this. It's really common um, that we see these kind of abnormalities in our pets at home. So when we talk about tooth fractures, there are two types of fractures. There are complicated fractures and there are uncomplicated fractures. And how we kind of distinguish them is based off if the pulp is exposed. So the inside of the tooth is exposed. So you can see here on this complicated fracture, there is blood. And that's because that pulp chamber has been exposed. And that's what runs through the whole inside of the tooth. It has the blood supply to the tooth and it also has the nerves to the tooth. Uncomplicated fractures are we don't see that pink um, hue and we don't see that bleeding. So it broke off the outside of the tooth, but didn't quite expose the pulp. So when we have these uncomplicated fractures, these normally don't need treatment. Um, they can sometimes lead to a tooth dying, but it's very rare. So when we see a kind of a chip fracture like this, we often recommend that we take an x-ray to make sure this tooth is vital, but often we don't need much more than that. The more problematic fracture are these complicated fractures. And that means we fractured the tooth and we see this bleeding and we expose that inside of the pulp. The problem when that happens is kind of twofold. One, this hurts. So I don't know if anyone's broken a tooth, but it, it can be really painful because we've exposed those nerves inside the tooth. The other problem is now we have a beeline straight into that inside of the tooth for bacterial infection. So complicated fractures always require treatment. So sometimes I'll hear that um, people recommend monitoring these, and unfortunately that is inappropriate. These always need to be treated. And the reason is it might not happen right away, but with time, this pulp is gonna become infected um, and it's going to develop an abscess around the tooth root. So we can see here on this X-ray that that kind of dark area is actually an abscess that's formed around the tooth root. And those abscesses can be very painful. They can also lead to facial swelling and also like we talked about systemic infection and inflammation. So our treatment options for a complicated fracture or a fracture that's exposed the inside of the tooth includes a root canal procedure or extracting that tooth or pulling that tooth. So a root canal procedure is often our primary recommendation. And the reason for that is it allows that tooth to be functionally maintained in the mouth. It also is actually less traumatic of an option than surgical extraction. And I know that can be counterintuitive, um, but it's because root canals and how we do them in dogs are actually a bit different than how they're done in humans. 
So when we talk about doing a root canal in a dog, um, normally what we do first is we make just a really small, what we call access into the tooth. So just this teeny hole. And through that, we can then send a file down the tooth. We can remove that inside of the tooth, that infected pulp material. So we kind of instrument that out. That's referred to as instrumentation. And at the same time, we sterilize that inside of the tooth. So we get rid of all that bacterial infection that's present. Once we've completely cleaned out that infected pulp, we then replace it with an inert material that's called obturation. And then we place a final restoration on top to kind of seal it from the top. So kind of when we think about root canal in dogs, it's quite different than humans because often when we're doing this root canal, the inside of the tooth has already died. So it tends to not be painful like we would think about it in us. Um, and we don't have to take away a lot of tooth structure like we would in humans. The access into the pulp chamber is much smaller. Um, so because of that, it's actually much less traumatic of a procedure than extracting this tooth. So if we had to extract this tooth, we would have to drill away a, a lot of the bone that's holding this tooth in place. Root canal is, has a pretty high success rate in dogs. So when we talk about root canal success, what we're talking about is how likely is it to prevent that abscess from forming? Or if that abscess is already there, how likely is it to treat that abscess and allow it to heal? So that success rate is 94%. Um, but that does mean that about 6% of the time, this procedure will fail. So despite us doing a root canal, we'll still get an abscess. Um, so we do need to follow up for root canals. Root canal success in cats is also fairly high, um, depending on the study, might be anywhere from 80 to 90%. And the reason this success is lower than dogs is because cats are more likely to have tooth resorption. As I said, for root canals, we are gonna follow these up. Um, so we are gonna have to do imaging. What we traditionally do here at the U is actually what we call a comb beam CT rather than just x-rays. Um, and it, that can allow us to see if there's an abscess forming. So for example, on this comb beam CT, you can see there's that bright material that we put in the tooth. And this tooth is actually being eaten away from the bottom because there's an abscess there. If we see something like this that shows us that this root canal has failed, then at this point we need to extract the tooth or actually do a surgical root canal. So come in through the bottom of that tooth and clean it out from that side. But either way, unfortunately, it would be another procedure. So if follow-up is not something that you'd be interested in, surgical extraction is a better option, right? So if the tooth's not there, it can never be a problem. The other reason we might choose surgical extraction over a root canal is if the tooth has other what we call comorbidities or diseases that make the root canal more likely to fail. So things like tooth resorption or advanced periodontal disease. Um, sometimes we'll also be more likely to do extraction if it's not a strategic tooth. So we really like to save the fang teeth, those canine teeth as well as the big chewing teeth. We think that functionally those are very important for dogs and cats. Um, so we can root canal any tooth, but we're, we're often less likely to kind of put it as our primary recommendation if it's an incisor or a small premolar. The pros to surgical extraction are by far, these are the more predictable treatment option, but the con, the negative to doing this is the animal is gonna completely lose the function of their tooth. And there's also increased morbidity, meaning there's a bigger chance for complication during the procedure when we're doing extraction, because we have to remove all of that bone. Uh, it's a little bit of a longer healing period after the surgery. So, you know, about seven to 14 days of healing versus root canal. Actually, the next day, they can normally go back to their normal diet, tend to be feeling quite good. The other thing I wanna point out um, is with crowns. So in humans, it'd be very common to always put a crown on a tooth after we do a root canal. In our dogs and cats, we often don't need to do crowns unless we can't remove the ongoing force, right? So they're really big Frisbee players and their whole life is obsessed with Frisbee and we're never gonna stop playing Frisbee. We'll probably put a crown on to protect that tooth going onward. Or the other reason is on big, the big chewing teeth, the upper eights, um, they often will significantly change the structure of the tooth. So you can see here, like this whole piece of tooth was breaking off. So we'd want to rebuild the normal structure of the tooth and we would do that with a crown. 
In dogs and cats, we would do full metal crowns. This is the strongest material that's available versus um, in us where we would do more of a porcelain crown because it's more aesthetically pleasing. But in general, it's pretty rare that if we do a root canal, we have to do a crown. It's definitely not the standard of care. Um, but in some cases, this is something that we'll recommend. Again, the biggest thing that I want you guys to know are that these problems are avoidable. Um, and the biggest things you want to avoid are treats that are harder than the tooth itself. So anything that's harder than the tooth material itself has the capacity to break the tooth. So a good general rule is, can you indent your fingernail into um, the treater toy? So can you indent your fingernail into it and kind of see that mark? And would you feel comfortable hitting that toy against your own kneecap? So if you would not want to take that toy or treat and hit it against your kneecap, then you do not want to give it to your dogs. So things that are bad, and I see very commonly fractured teeth, are real bones, nyla bones, bully sticks, deer antlers, things that are really hard. Things that I would recommend in their place are Kongs. I think Kongs are an excellent option. I think a really great option is to take wet food and freeze it inside the Kong. Um, and then it's really good. They can take a while trying to lick it out, get it free, you can entertain them for a while. Rope toys are really great options. Um, you can soak them in chicken stock and then they'll kind of suckle and play with them stuffy toys um, or other kind of softer toys, including soft raw hides are really good options to keep them entertained, puzzle toys, but not have that risk of fracturing the tooth. So again, prevention is really the best thing we can do. But if you notice it, it's not okay to monitor those complicated fractures. We really want to make sure that they get treated. So those are kind of my overview of those common things that we're going to see, those periodontal disease and fractures. So I'm happy to answer kind of, I know there were a bunch of pre-questions and I saw a bunch of questions while we are going through. Thank you so much, Dr. Goldschmidt for an excellent presentation. And thank you, thank you for leaving so much time because there were a ton of questions pouring in. Uh, in addition, we had over 200 pre-submitted questions come in before the event. So we'll jump right into those. But first, just a reminder to everybody attending that if you do wanna ask a question, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen instead of using the raise hand feature. Um, and I'm not sure if you can see me or not. There might've been a little technical difficulty, but can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Perfect, thank you. All right, we're gonna jump in. So in addition to good practices on dental hygiene, such as regular veterinary dental cleaning and treatment and brushing, are there foods or treats that are helpful in maintaining clean and strong canine teeth? Yeah, so the biggest thing is choosing those kind of treats and foods that are veterinary oral health council approved. Um, so I personally like Hills TD, however, it is highly calorific. So you definitely need to keep that in mind with your nutrition plan. Um, and then dental treats, I like Tartar Shield and Greenies, but keep in mind when those studies were out, they were given once a day. So make sure if you are giving those treats, you're giving them at least once a day. So they're really kind of a daily part of your oral health regime and that you're accordingly kind of decreasing the food a little bit. So then you're not having them get too overweight. And outside of prescription stuff, all, all these should be available over, over the counter at a pet food store. Correct. Most should be available over the counter. A lot are actually available on Amazon. Like I know you can get Oravet on Amazon. The only ones that are prescription are Hills, um, but I think the science diet one you can get at a grocery store. Perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, another question. Does bad breath typically correlate with periodontal issues? Yes. So it's one of the first signs we see with periodontal disease. So it means that we have an accumulation of too much bacteria in the mouth. And then that bacteria produces volatile sulfur compounds. And that's what leads to the smell. So it's never normal for breath to smell like bad. Um, that means that there is periodontal disease occurring. Excellent. Thank you. So the, we got a lot of questions about types of toothbrush and toothpaste. So oh, I'm sure. just going to go through a bunch of them. Um, what is the safest toothpaste to use? And what is the best toothbrush that you recommend? So for toothbrush, I would not waste your money on like the veterinary ones. I would go to CVS and get a soft breast bristle pediatric toothbrush. So one that's really soft and get it from like $2, that would be the best option. Um, and then as far as toothpaste, I think the CET toothpaste is a great choice. But as I mentioned in the presentation, it's totally fine to just use water. So there has been no study that showed if we brush with toothpaste, it's any better than just brushing alone. So it's really that mechanical action, that massaging the gingiva, that disrupting the plaque. So 
If the toothpaste helps because your dog or cat loves the taste, great. If it's not helping, just use water. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, a couple of people asked about the rubber toothbrushes that go over your finger. Is, are those a good alternative as well? They might be easier to maneuver. Yeah, they're not quite as good. Okay. Um, so the soft bristle toothbrush, the way that the bristles can get under the gum line is why they're the best. If that's not working for you, you can use the finger brush, but they don't, their kind of bristles are just not as good as getting under the gum line. Perfect. And then are tug ropes or other toys or even foods like carrots an acceptable way to mechanically remove plaque? So they can be, we just don't have any studies. So they've never taken a group of dogs and said like, hey, here you eat these carrots and you are on regular kibble. So we don't know that they would necessarily make a difference, but really anything that's gonna mechanically disrupt the plaque is going to be helpful. Um, so I wouldn't use it as your only option for plaque prevention, but certainly we see big dogs that are heavy players do tend to have less plaque accumulation. Yeah. Um, so small dogs are a little bit more challenging at times to do than bigger dogs. Do you have any recommendations for what's best to use on a small dog or even tips or techniques? Yeah, I think the best thing ideally would be brushing in your small dogs. We know they're going to be genetically more predisposed to having periodontal disease. Um, if they won't let you brush, then I would probably add in a daily dental treat, right? Most dogs do really like treats and that can be a really good option if you can't get in their mouth and brush. And then I think you just need to be committed to small dogs really do need once yearly cleaning. Sometimes some dogs even need tighter than a year. Like Duke, my dog who I showed in the video, he needs a cleaning every nine months. He just is very predisposed to periodontal disease. Got it. And what about electric toothbrushes? If you can get your dog used to it, is it something that you'd recommend? If you can get your dog used to it, it is the best. <laughs> so awesome. it's the best. We should all be using electric toothbrushes. Most dogs go bananas for the noise and just won't tolerate it. But if you have a really good dog and they'll let you do a uh, electric toothbrush, perfect. Just make sure you get a children's one. So the bristles are really soft. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, Another question is, uh, is it okay to brush your dog's teeth with water or coconut oil, or is it preferable to use a dog a specific toothpaste? Water is fine. I would, the coconut oil is fine, but I would avoid it. Um, cause essentially they're going to be swallowing a ton of it and it could lead to GI upset. Okay. A few people asked how often can, uh, teeth be cleaned professionally? I know you mentioned your dog nine months. Um, yes. a lot of people think it more annually, but is there a even tighter interval that you could do? Yeah, so do. in some patients we'll do every six months, um, or even in some of our really advanced patients every four months. So kind of in an ideal world, it's kind of based on how much plaque they're accumulating and their response. And there's no kind of, this is too tight of an interval. Um, the biggest thing is that they have to be under anesthesia for these cleanings. So even though the risk of an anesthetic related complication is very low, less than 1%, we obviously want to consider that we don't want to be anesthetizing them too often if we don't need to. So essentially we'll try to stretch it out to the longest interval between professional cleanings that we don't see advanced disease. Excellent. So for our pets that have more sensitive stomachs, are there any GI sensitive dental treats you would recommend or, G, or even GI friendly toothpaste that we need to be kind of conscientious of? That is a great question. And no, there's not one off the top of my head that I can think about. Um, I would say if they have sensitive tummies, I wouldn't do a dental diet. I would probably try a soft rawhide and see if they could tolerate that. Um, like I know the large CET rawhide, it can take them a really long time to eat that. And I, I have not personally seen a lot of GI upset with that. Excellent. Uh, to kind of cement in what you were just talking about, um, you ended the presentation a little bit with this, but what can you know my dog chew safely knowing that many of the synthetic bones uh, present risks to breaking teeth and alternatives kind of like the raw hides or pizzle sticks aren't recommended from like a nutritional standpoint? Yeah, I, I really like Kongs. Um, I think Kongs are a great option when we freeze our, you know, treats inside, freeze our food inside. I think rope toys are a great option. Um, and then there are like similar to that Kong material. You can find a number of toys like that in different shapes puzzles. Um, I think those are really great options for our pets. And then um, most of the rawhides that are made like dental rawhides 
tend to disintegrate a little faster, not break off in big chunks. And that means that they often don't get any GI problems with those. Awesome. So I know our human dentists want us to brush our teeth for at least two minutes, uh, at least twice a day. What do you recommend for dogs? How long should you be brushing th their teeth each time? So essentially the biggest thing is getting over each tooth with the toothbrush. Um, if you can do it twice, the more you can brush the teeth, the better. Um, as far as a time frame, as long as you get each tooth, that is fine. You don't need to focus more on the time on each tooth. Excellent. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Can professional cleanings be done without sedation? Oh, that's a really good question. So those are referred to as anesthesia-free dental cleanings, and they are strongly recommended against. So anesthesia-free dental cleanings are recommended to not be performed by both the College of Anesthesia. Um, so our colleagues that help us with, you know, keeping our pets comfortable and the, all the diplomats from the American Veterinary Dental College. And the reason for that is the biggest place we need to catch up or like kind of clean up with a professional cleaning that we don't do with brushing is under the gum line. And if your dog or cat is not sedated or under anesthesia, we can't clean under the gum line safely, right? So you'd have to be holding them down, just terrifying, taking a sharp instrument going under the gum line. And often we leave plaque bacteria behind. So it's been really sad as I've had a few patients that they say, oh, we've been getting cleanings every year for six years or so. And then we get them under true anesthesia to evaluate them and they need 25 extractions because there's been so much advanced disease. So um, unfortunately for professional cleanings, they do need to be performed under anesthesia. Thank you. Um, we had somebody ask uh, or make the, make the comment, their dog's teeth appear great with no apparent plaque, but could there still be calculus beneath the gums that's just not visible to, to us, the human eye? Yes, there definitely could be still under the gum line. So um, in those cases, I would say, get a professional cleaning, they'll evaluate everything. And if everything truly looks great, then excellent. You know, maybe we don't need to do another professional cleaning for a few years, um, but there's no way to know if we're missing something without x-rays and an anesthetized oral examination. Excellent. So a lot of questions have focused on dogs that I've been asking, but we, we do know we have a lot of clients that have cats and they're, they're wondering, do we have the same recommendations for getting a cat comfortable with brushing as we do for the canine counterparts? Yeah, we do have the same recommendations, kind of make it really positive, lots of treats. Um, you know, you can put the toothbrush in tuna water, make it really fun. Cats tend to historically be much harder. Um, but if you start young, you can get them used to you being in their mouth and near their mouth. Excellent. And I, a lot of people like to throw the dog an ice cube to chew on. Is that acceptable? It's okay. Um, so ice cubes can be it's rare. Ice cubes sometimes can be hard enough to chip a tooth. Um, it's unusual. The bigger thing with ice is if they do have a fracture and you don't know about it, it would be really sensitive to the cold. Um, so we try to avoid ice cubes if we can. Okay. Um, this is a, a comment that one of our guests made. It, brushing is so difficult. It's absolute torture for me and my dogs. I think a lot of us can relate to that. Um, but their question is, how long do sealants last and how much do they typically cost? What would be an estimate? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and it's really normal. The reality is most of my clients do not brush, which is fine, right? So it's always better to be honest about it and talk about kind of other options. Um, so dental sealants are two main brands. One is called Oravet and Oravet um, is a little bit thicker. It's like a Vaseline and that's placed on the time of the cleaning. At the time of the cleaning, I think it adds about $30. And then it is done weekly at home. Um, I don't know the cost off the top of my head, but I know that you can get it at um, Amazon. And then essentially you just kind of wipe your finger along the teeth. Um, Orvet decreases plaque and calcus accumulation by about 40%. The other brand is Sanos. Um, Sanos is, lasts about six months, which is really nice. You don't have to do it at all at home. Sanos is a bit more expensive at the time of the cleaning, and it adds about $80. Um, so I think adding on dental sealants is a great option and is something that I would definitely recommend. Awesome. Thank you. We have somebody that's listening as a dog with a slab fracture mm -hmm. of an upper premolar, but they can't get a dental appointment for nearly two months. How should they protect the tooth and prevent infection while they're waiting for their upcoming appointment? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I know that it's been really hard you know, that veterinarians, unfortunately, everywhere are a little overwhelmed. Everyone got a dog during the pandemic. Um, the biggest thing is 
you can definitely go to your call your vet. I know you can't even get in for an appointment, but if you have a pre-established general veterinarian, you can ask them one for pain medications if you're noticing anything, and then a short course of antibiotics as well. Um, and then I would just watch your dog for any signs of infection. The biggest thing we'll see with infections on that tooth is actually facial swelling. So if you notice that, then I would call them again and say, Hey, you know, we're seeing signs of infection that short course of antibiotics didn't protect it. I think we need to either get in sooner or, um, you know, do another course of antibiotics as we're waiting to get in. But a lot of times the body for a while is going to try to fight off that infection within that pulp before it's died. So we often do have a lag time before we get an abscess that forms. Thank you. Um, for some of our dogs that tend to be more aggressive chewers, should we limit how much our dogs chew on tennis balls, uh, rope toys, or other things? Yeah, so tennis balls, I would limit. Um, tennis balls, because they're kind of like felt, can actually start to grind down or abrade the teeth. And you might notice that if you look at your dog's incisors right now, these little teeth in the front. Um, normally rope toys are fine. And dogs that are heavy chewers, it's often better to give them a safe toy to chew on um, and keep them entertained, because if not, they'll go find unsafe toys to chew on. Thank you. Can I might need help with one of these words, but can you tell us what cat owners should know about feline? Is it resorption lesions? Yeah, feline resorption. Um, so dogs actually can get resorption too. It's just a little less common. Um, essentially, it's idiopathic, meaning we don't know what sets it off, but the body starts to eat away at the tooth. So the body starts to actually kind of take bites out of the tooth and expose that inside of the tooth, just like a fracture. So that that pulp chamber, which can be really painful. Unfortunately, there's no prevention for tooth resorption. And because it's progressive, we recommend extraction to get rid of that pain. Um, so with tooth resorption, it is common. So about 50% of older cats will get it. So what it will look like in your cat's mouth is like a pink lump on the tooth or the gum will kind of grow up over it to kind of protect that hole. So if you notice it, you definitely want to get your cat evaluated to have, unfortunately, that tooth extracted. And then once we've noticed tooth resorption, we often recommend survey radiographs to make sure we're not missing any new lesions about every year. Excellent. Thank you. Testing your clinical studies knowledge a little bit. Um, are there any studies that show a difference in dog's oral health if they're giving given human food versus dog food for their diet? Uh, there are not. So there, that I'm aware of. Um, there are no <laughs> studies that look at human versus dog food. Um, there are some studies that look at hard food versus soft food. And surprisingly, it wasn't that different. The biggest thing is the difference between a true dental diet versus kibble versus wet food, because dental diets are actually created to not kind of crumble when you bite into them. Rather, when the tooth goes in, it gets stuck and then it pulls off the kibble, which helps mechanically clean the tooth. Um, so definitely if you're trying to use diet as prevention, I would use a dental diet. Um, in general, I, I would recommend dog food just because it's nutritionally balanced. And if you're making a homemade diet, I'd recommend talking to a nutritionist to make sure that you're not missing out on any important factors, but from a oral health standpoint, there's not been shown to be a difference. Awesome. Um, another question we have, and I know my dog falls into this case too, but, um, what can we do when our pet is unable to have a dental due to an advanced age or a health issue where there where anesthesia, anesthesia wouldn't be safe? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and that's a lot of actually the patients we see. So it does have to get to kind of this risk benefit of how bad is the periodontal disease. So if the periodontal disease is getting so severe that we're talking about, you know, those really bad complications that I mentioned, jaw fractures, an oral nasal fistula, holes between, you know, the mouth and the nose, then at that point, often it, it is worth it to still do an anesthetized procedure, but do it somewhere that has an anesthesia service. And um, I'm not sure if you're all aware about this, but the University of Minnesota is the only specialty clinic in the whole state of Minnesota that has boarded anesthesiologists. So, you know, we're really great for that. Um, we do anesthetize patients that are more high risk all the time and we, and we do it safely, but we want to make sure that the benefit's going to be worth the risk. So in a patient that has, you know, mild periodontal disease, and we don't think it's going to progress to those advanced stages within their lifetime. Often at that point, unfortunately we say, Hey, you know, we know this is probably going to progress, but hopefully nothing painful is going to happen. And we're going to kind of just watch for any complications. So often we'll have that conversation together on what we think is the best option. 
Um, but kind of trying to do more things to slow plaque prevention at home can certainly be helpful as well. Excellent. But a few people ask about, you know, what to choose between a primary care veterinarian to do the dental exam versus a board certified veterinarian. Yeah. I know at the University of Minnesota, we have our primary care service that does it and we have our dentistry service that does it. So any tips to choosing between the two or what's better for your pet? Yeah, so I think the biggest thing is if you're doing that prevention that we really talked about, that should definitely be with your regular vet. So they are the ones you should go to for those prevention examinations. Um, our primary care service and most primary care vets also are very inept at, or very inept, very adapt, excuse me, at doing surgical extraction. So, you know, if you know that I don't want to do any advanced periodontal therapy. I really am just going to want to extract the tooth and not worry about it. Again, that'd be a good option for your primary veterinarian. If you're thinking you're wanting to save teeth, like doing things like putting bone grafts in or root canal therapy, those type of procedures, and that's when you should go to a specialist. Um, that's where they're going to be better suited. Other times that we normally recommend a specialist is when the anesthesia is a bit more risky um, because we just tend, is it's all we do, we tend to be a little faster and then we can minimize the time under anesthesia. Excellent. Thank you. Um... Is there anything different that we should do for cats in terms of prevention, schedules for cleaning, et cetera? Is it really just fall in line with the same as dogs? It's the same as dogs, which is surprising to a lot of people. A lot of people don't even think about doing the first cleaning in cats till they're much older, but really we, we want to start at that young age as well. So getting them for their first evaluation at about a year and then setting them up with a schedule from there. Um, and then if at all possible, brushing is the best, but if you can't, a lot of cats do like, um, the greenies make a cat treat, so does Tartar Shields. And I think most cats do enjoy those. Excellent. But a few people um, ask about CET enzymes. So can you talk a little bit more about the benefits of CET enzymes? Yeah, so the enzymes they're talking about are natural salivary enzymes. So naturally our saliva tends to be antibacterial. So they've kind of taken those antibacterial agents and put them in a treat. Um, we don't know if you don't have dry mouth and you have normal saliva to having those extra enzymes make things any better. Um, potentially not. However, you know, most of CET's products have gone through clinical trials. So the CET enzyme rawhide and there's a CET enzymatic toothpaste. So we know that they both have VOHC approval. They decrease plaque and calculus by about 20%. So I think both of those are good options. Um, and I think that dogs, at least my dog, really likes the taste of the CET enzymatic toothpaste. Excellent. Um, what are your thoughts on pet dental wipes or even some of the over-the-counter gels that you can buy? Yeah, I think that they're okay. So they're not going to mechanically disrupt the plaque as well as brushing, but they're better than doing nothing. They are kind of going to wipe along that tooth. The bad thing is they don't get under the gum line as well. So they would be kind of lower on my pyramid. Um, over the counter, I think is fine. It's just, if it doesn't have that seal of approval, we're not sure that it's better than doing nothing at all. So I really recommend making sure you find something that has that seal. And then we know that it's definitely going to work. Excellent. So I think we got time for probably just about two more questions. Um, uh, another good question that somebody wrote is, do dogs grind their teeth like some humans do? Oh, that's a great question. So we call that bruxing and they can, um, and it's normally a sign of pain. So they, you know how some humans will just do it at night. It's really rare for dogs to just do it. Um, they'll normally do it because they're uncomfortable. So if you're hearing like a grinding noise, I would definitely have an evaluation, especially in cats. That's something they do quite commonly with tooth resorption is they'll do that grinding or bruxing as we call it because they're uncomfortable. Excellent. Okay. Final question. Do you, <laughs> can you confirm, do you re recommend brushing your pet's teeth twice a day or once a day? So I normally recommend once a day because I think twice a day is a little unrealistic. Um, and it takes about 24 hours for plaque to become calculus. So if you brush at least once a day, you're going to disrupt that mineralization. Excellent. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for saving a lot of time to answer all the questions. It was great. Um, and thank you to our many participants that shared such thoughtful questions in advance and during the presentation. As always, the Veterinary Medical Center is here for you 24 hours a day, seven days a week to help you care for your pet. Please don't hesitate to reach out to us. If you enjoy learning more about our work tonight, we encourage you to visit our website or reach out to us directly to learn more about our mission to improve the health and well-being of animals and people. We hope you'll consider supporting the Lewis Small Animal Hospital through philanthropy. Gifts play a critical role in expanding our work and we thank everyone joining us tonight who supports the Lewis Small Animal Hospital. We look forward to welcoming you next month when Dr. Steve Friedenberg will join us to discuss how advances in genetic sequencing will lead to new discoveries in animal health. Thank you again for attending tonight. Stay warm, stay safe.